1960, Colonel John Boyd published the Aerial Attack Study, the first manual for air combat. His hypothesis was that success in a dogfight could be boiled down into an algorithm of moves and counter moves. If a pilot could learn to instinctively apply this algorithm, then he or she would emerge victorious in a dogfight more often than not. Understanding Boyd's thinking is important in understanding air combat in the 1960s, 70s and 80s, as his study was the most publicised and widely available such text available to US and NATO pilots. It was delivered to them in a dry, typed format accompanied by a few diagrams. The complete document is 146 pages of dense, single-spaced text. I've made this video because I find it helpful to have Boyd's algorithm in mind when watching videos about contemporary dogfighting or doing other types of research to understand what the book says a pilot should have done in a given situation, and, of course, whether the book was right in that instance. Boyd was an instructor pilot for the F-100, and he used that as his reference aircraft for the study. The Super Sabre was contemporary with the MiG-19 and also faced off against the MiG-21, but Boyd doesn't reference either in particular and doesn't explicitly talk about exploiting dissimilarities between aircraft. His advice to pilots applies irrespective of aircraft type as the ultimate objective of any interceptor or air superiority pilot is to place his or her aircraft in a position to effectively deploy their weapons against the opponent. The F-100 has two potential weapons to deploy in a fighter versus fighter engagement. Its primary weapon is the AIM-9B Sidewinder, and the Super Sabre also has four 20mm cannons as a backup. Boyd provides considerable detail about the early Sidewinder and the correct envelope in which to employ it. I've covered the basic limitations in a previous video, which I'll link to in the show notes. But in summary, the pilot has to consider four basic limitations when employing the AIM-9B. IR, range, G, and lambda. Against a non-maneuvering target, that means delivering the missile into a cone 60 degrees wide emanating from the rear of the target. The length of that cone depends on the altitude of the target and the attacking aircraft's closure speed. For various reasons related to the performance of the missile and how the seek ahead works, the optimum position to make an attack is from 6 o'clock low, with the target silhouetted against the sky. Just to remind you, this is the first version of the Sidewinder. It was a technical miracle at the time, but it is far removed from the capabilities of today's AIM-9X or even the late 1970s AIM-9L. When employing the AIM-9B against a manoeuvring target, the shape of the cone changes shape and diminishes in size. For example, if the AIM-9B is launched from too long a range against a fighter, that fighter will, or at least should, turn into the attack. This turn attempts to put the missile outside of the 60 degree rearwards cone in which it can track the target. Even if the defender doesn't succeed in doing so, they will at least force the missile to turn harder in order to track them. In doing so, they may cause the missile's gyro seeker to hit its mechanical stops. The missile will then lose guidance. Boyd provides some useful charts that illustrate how the size and shape of the effective envelope changes with different target manoeuvres. The upshot of all of this analysis is that the best attack profile is one in which the attacker is closing on the target from a small angle off the rear, as this provides the greatest freedom of manoeuvre and the opportunity to launch at longer ranges. Conversely, the worst possible attack is where the defender is travelling faster and there is a high angle off. Here we're only considering horizontal separation of the attacker and the target. We also need to think about vertical positioning. In essence, the advice here is that is the same as that for a fighter attacking a bomber. IR and G limitations of the missile dictate that the best attack is from below, as the missile has gravity on its side to manoeuvre and the sensor has the clearest view of the target. Attacks from above are disadvantageous as the missile seeker can be distracted by the ground, and the missile's ability to track the target within lambda and G constraints are diminished. Negative delta Mach makes this restriction even worse, meaning that in pursuit of a diving enemy, the attacker needs to at least match speed with the target. You can hopefully see that although the AIM-9 Sidewinder is a powerful weapon, it can only be employed in a very small window, which means that the pilot has to work hard to correctly position their aircraft for its delivery. You can also likely see how challenging employment of the AIM-9B was in Vietnam, fighting against MiG-17s who like to hug the ground and work in circling formations. Employing the gun is in theory easier. The challenge, however, is getting into position to deliver a sufficient weight of fire. A cannon, or four cannons in this case, shoot a narrow cone of shells straight out of the noise of the aircraft. Hitting the target means achieving sufficient lead that the target flies through the shells and sustains enough hits to destroy it. The pilot needs to manoeuvre into an angular velocity cone behind their opponent and hold this position for a period of time. 
The constant pull of gravity, defined parameters within which the fighter's weapons can be employed, and the defined dynamic performance of the aircraft means that there is a finite number of situations and solutions to this problem of how to get into a position behind the opponent in any given tactical encounter. Because of these constraints, the pilot operates within a three-dimensional field that looks like a sphere squashed at the top and elongated at the base. The spherical shape is generated by the manoeuvring fighter's turn and velocity operating through three dimensions. The elongation is due to gravity constraining upwards movement and accelerating downwards movement. The pilot can employ two mechanisms to obtain an advantage in a fighter versus fighter engagement within this field. They can change turn angle or velocity. Both can be accomplished in two-dimensional or three-dimensional manoeuvres and there is a small number of effective manoeuvres in any given situation. There is no such thing, I'm afraid, as a secret dogfighting move that unexpectedly gives you an advantage. Physics simply precludes it. Although doing something unwise, I see you, Su-27 Cobra, might surprise an opponent. If they are able to remain calm, then they will just gun you down later in the engagement. With that setup complete, we can discuss the manoeuvres themselves. We'll start with the defensive turn, because that is often the first thing that a defender will do when they realise they're about to come under attack, or that an attack has already been initiated. The purpose of the defensive turn is to prevent the opponent from achieving a launching or firing position. To understand it, let's put ourselves in a situation commonly encountered by US flyers in Vietnam, where an attacker armed with an IR missile approaches from our 6 o'clock. How do we defend this? A hard turn in a shallow dive increases off angle sufficiently to reduce the possibility of an IR lock-on and increases lambda to a point at which the missile will not be able to track us if launched. The slight dive has the advantage of further reducing IR effectiveness by increasing background clutter and retains our velocity for future manoeuvres. Note that this isn't a maximum G break. If we did that then we would likely evade the initial missile shot, but we would reduce velocity so much that we would be vulnerable to a follow-up gun attack. We don't want this. Our hard turn has now incre increased closure rate because we're no longer travelling away from the attacker. As he or she gets within 3,000 feet, we need now need to concern ourselves with evading the gun attack. How do we do this? Boyd gives us some math for it, but in short we need to now increase G and create a situation in which we are turning more tightly than the attacker. That will render them unable to generate enough lead for a gun attack. If we're facing a similar aircraft to our own, then this means reducing relative speed and increasing G. Because of the attacker's closure rate, they will be unable to stay on the outside of our turn and in a firing position. If they attempt to turn more tightly, then they will end up on the inside and we will have become the attacker. Since they are likely ready for this eventuality, they will overshoot. At this point, we have the option to extend an afterburner and escape, or to reverse our turn and attempt to position to deliver a shot of our own. Because we are now slower than our opponent, we should be able to turn back inside him at maximum performance and full reverse rudder to put him at our 12 o'clock. If the attacker successfully defends this with a turn of his own, then we enter a series of turn reversals known as a scissors. The scissors is dangerous for the pilot as airspeed falls rapidly with each reversal, reducing the manoeuvre potential of the aircraft and leaving a standoff situation in which he'll be vulnerable to another aircraft or to the original attacker. Boyd therefore advises concluding the scissors on the second reversal, which is bad news for the attacker who is in a serious position as soon as he or she overshoots and hands the initiative to the defender. Avoiding the scissors is therefore essential for the attacker once their initial missile and gun attacks have been countered. The defender's high G break has successfully prevented a gun attack but has come at the cost of speed to manoeuvre. The attacker can take advantage of this by executing a high speed yo-yo in order to prevent an overshoot. A well-timed high-speed yo-yo trades speed for altitude, kinetic energy for potential energy, facilitating the attacker turning inside the defender and emerging from the manoeuvre in the defender's rear quarter with greater energy. Defending the high-speed yo-yo requires close observation and timing. If the attacker is too aggressive and pulls up too hard, then the defender can simply relax, light the afterburner, and dive for separation. This leaves the attacker with a negative Delta Mac overhead missile shot from range, the worst possible position to execute an AIM-9B shot. If the attacker executes their move correctly, then the defender's best course of action is to relax G of their turn as soon as they see the attacker starting to climb, but maintaining bank angle so that the nose drops. This provides some additional speed that will use, be useful in a handful of seconds. As the attacker drops their nose and begins to set up for an AIM-9B or gun attack, the defender pulls up into that attack. This has the effect of radically reducing the opportunity for the attacker to deliver their weapons 
and leaves them in a nose-low position carrying much greater speed. The attacker therefore overshoots. The defender is able to slide into his or her six o'clock and set up their own attack. The attacker can, of course, counter this move if he uses his airspeed to his advantage. As soon as he sees the defender executing a rolling pull-up, he rolls off the defender's line and starts a smooth pull-up of his own. Because he has more speed, he is able to climb above and then roll behind the defender, or if the defender attempts to dive away, the attacker can cut through in the horizontal plane and set up on the defender's 6 o'clock. The high-speed yo-yo is an excellent offensive manoeuvre when the attacker has a rate of closure but cannot match the defender's turn rate. But what if we're further away from the defender, or at a higher angle off from their rear? Even though superficially similar, we're trying to reduce velocity, cut off and then turn inside our opponent, the high-speed yo-yo has little value in this situation because we're going to end up far too high and with a negative closure rate. The defender is just going to escape. Instead, the most effective manoeuvre here is a barrel roll attack. The attacker dives below and inside the defender's defensive turn. This gives the attacker more airspeed, which would instantly seem like a problem, except for the fact that the attacker can quickly trade this airspeed for height. The attacker pulls up on the inside of the defender's defensive turn, then barrel rolls into an opposite direction to the opponent's turn. If the attacker gets this right, then they end up on the defender 6 o'clock low in the perfect place for an aim 9 b shot if they have sufficient nose-to-tail separation, or for a cannon attack if they don't. The barrel roll attack is difficult for the defender to counter, which is why judging the right time to execute a defensive turn is important. The best strategy for the defender is to wait for the attacker to immediately light the afterburner and dive for separation as soon as the attacker begins their pull-up. This forces the attacker to perform a 180 degree change of direction in the vertical plane, killing a lot of airspeed and leaving the attacker with an overhead shot at negative delta mag, not the optimum weapons delivery position. So anyway, the barrel roll is highly effective attacking manoeuvre, and it can be used at shorter ranges and lower angles off in order to reduce rate of closure and angle off and provide the defender little opportunity to gain separation. It is also very good for setting the attacker up for an aim 9 b shot. So far, Boyd has helped us understand manoeuvres that help the attacker when he or she needs to reduce their closure rate in order to prevent an overshoot. But what if the attacker has negative delta mac and is out of range for an aim 9 b shot? The answer is probably now quite obvious. The attacker needs to light their afterburner and dive below the opponent. Leveling out no more than 10,000 feet below, they then press the attack from 6 o'clock low, climbing shallowly with positive delta mac to shoot a sidewinder, or closing still further to set up for a cannon attack. This low-speed yo-yo can also be employed in a horizontal turning fight that is degraded into a Loughborough circle, a stalemate situation in which the fighters follow each other round a, a circle of ever-decreasing size at ever-falling velocity, neither able to get enough lead to deliver a weapon. The next subject Boyd tackles is how as the defender you can counter the overhead attack with negative delta mac that appears in a number of the previous scenarios. Although this is the worst position from which to deliver an aim 9 shot, you are still on the defensive at this point and you still have a missile to evade. Fortunately, this isn't too hard as the combination of off-angle and negative closure speed means that almost any horizontal manoeuvre by the defender will lead to the missile exceeding the 2G limit for a successful launch. The defender does this by pulling up without afterburner. When the nose goes level, he lights the afterburner and zooms vertically upwards. Most likely, the attacker will then attempt to cut the defender off to secure a missile shot from 6 o'clock low. This is what the defender is hoping for. If the attacker attempts to cut them off, then he or she will lose the airspeed advantage of their dive. Because of their relative speeds at the point of the pullout, the defender now has the airspeed advantage. When it becomes apparent that the cutoff is no longer possible, the attacker also likely manoeuvres vertically in order to prevent an overshoot. The defender converts this sudden reversal of fortune by zooming past the attacker vertically, rolling off at the top of the climb and then dropping in on his 6 o'clock. Boyd also provides significant detail on the vertical or rolling scissors. I have to admit that I read this section about a dozen times and I really couldn't get what he was trying to communicate. I think the problem is that he gives about three different scenarios in which the manoeuvre could be employed and the diagram he then gives doesn't bear any resemblance to any of them. So if you'll forgive me, I went to a different source for an explanation on this. The defender initiates the vertical scissors in response to an attacker closing on them at speed. They turn into the attack, and in order to accentuate the overshoot, zoom vertically, rolling towards the attacker in order to set up their own attack. If the attacker does not respond, the defender finds themselves able to execute an aim 9 b or cannon attack. 
but more likely the attacker also climbs and rolls their aircraft, resulting in a situation in which both pilots are barrel rolling around each other, losing airspeed until the fight becomes purely horizontal or one aircraft stalls or crashes. Escaping the scissors entails the defender waiting until the attacker raises his nose to climb back up on the vertical leg of the scissors. When he sees this, if he is tight enough to the attacker's turn radius, he can light his afterburners and dive to separate. I hope that explanation makes sense. I'll provide a link to a good explainer I found on YouTube in the show notes. Finally, if all else fails, Boyd gives instructions for high-G barrel rolls, designed to throw off the attacker's aim if they have close to within gun range and are about to make the kill. With the attacker in close, the defender rolls over the top without releasing the G that is built up in their defensive turn. This roll rapidly reduces velocity, and if executed correctly, Boyd gives four pages of advice on how to do this, leads to the attacker overshooting and being put on the defensive. Reading all of this 65 years after it was written, with the benefit of various manuals, texts, flight simulators and YouTube videos, Boyd's text seems a little bit quaint. Obvious, even. We can practice these manoeuvres to our heart's content on DCS. Interviews I've seen from pilots who were serving at the time suggest that this work was, if not revolutionary, very well received by pilots in the US and NATO allies, at a time in which very little investment was being put into basic fighter manoeuvring and training, in aircraft and in weapons design, this document served as a useful primer on the theory of dogfighting. On the rare occasions that the opportunity presented itself for a quick scrap, some pilots were able to try and put the theory into practice. Clearly some squadrons were more open to this than others, leading to widely varying results when US aviators were forced to dogfight in the non-permissive rules of engagement they found in Vietnam. Anyhow, I hope you found this interesting. I'm aware it's a little dry. I'm also the first to admit that I'm just an enthusiast here. My appreciation for this content is as an observer, not as a fighter pilot. And I'm well aware that some of you are experienced aviators and some of you were serving in the early 1960s. I'd therefore love to hear from you in the comments, particularly in areas where I've misinterpreted Boyd's writings or the context of the time. Thanks so much for watching.